All right, I guess we'll get started. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to our first uh, panel, which is Not Your Dad's Old Toolbox, Open Source Tools for Mobility Data Specifications. My name is Omar Kabani, and I will be the moderator. Um, so just a note first, this session is being recorded. Uh, so if there's anything that you want to share that should be off the record, please give us a heads up before you speak some, you say it, and then we'll, we'll cut it out when we edit. So I work for Mobility Data. I work as a data specialist, and I've been working with them for over a year now. Last year, I worked on uh, on-demand services, and now I work on other stuff like fares and flexible services. My background is in civil engineering, and... Here's a small fun fact about myself. My favorite subway stop in Montreal is Lionel Gru, because if you have time and you want to explore transit things in Montreal, please go there. It's where the orange line intersects with the green line. And the nice thing about Lionel Gru is that you have uh, it's the green line goes down and the orange line goes up, so you get to do a cross-platform uh, transfer. It's not common everywhere, so it's 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 very nice. All right, so this is our um, agenda for, for this meeting. We'll do a quick introduction of what the session is about, and then we'll do three back-to-back -back, uh, sessions with our panelists. First, with Transit Data Tools from Ritesh from IBI. Then we'll talk about Skate by MBTA with Logan. And lastly, we'll end with Open Tools by the French National Access Point, or transportdata.gouv.fr. And it, it's going to be three back-to-back uh, -back sessions, and then at the end, we'll do a, one big Q&A session. Next slide. All right, so we're here to talk about the right tools for the job. Basically, the session is focused on tools that are developed to create transit data, to manage operations of transit, and to ensure that riders have access to good quality data. Next slide. So we have three great panelists here. The first one is Ritesh Urade from IBI Group. Then we have Logan Nash from the MBTA, and we also have Antoine Auguste from the French National uh, Access Point. And how this session looks like is we're going to have one hour for the three panelists. So each panelist get, uh, speaks for around 20 minutes about their, their, uh, tr their transit or mobility tool. And then once the session is over, once the three panelists are done, we will have a Q&A for around 30 minutes. So if you have any questions that pop up to your mind as, th as the speakers are speaking, please jot them down on the notepads provided, and then we get to ask uh, at the end. All right, so we're, we're, we're here to get started. Uh, our first panelist is Ritesh Orade. He is a director at, the, uh, at IBI Group. Uh, his words, not mine, he is a transit <laughs> nerd, and he loves working with data. He's worked for f over 15 years with transit data technology and planning, and he leads IBI Group's transit data team. Um, a, a big chunk of Ritesh's focus is, tra is passenger information and analytics projects. Um, one uh, kind of fun, interesting fact about Ritesh is that he kind of collects master's degrees. He has three master's degrees, and that's, that's absolutely incredible. So please welcome Ritesh. Thank you. <laughs> Great. I've not done this before, so let's hope everything goes as planned. Okay, so hi, I'm Ritesh Farade. As uh, Omar said, I'm a director at IBI. I lead our transit data team. We work with agencies on their data projects, on their passenger information, and their analytics projects. Everything we do touches GTFS. GTFS is essentially the lifeblood of every system, every consulting project we ever uh, work on. So, of course, we build tools to manage GTFS. What I'm going to show you is what we call transit data tools. Uh, the boring part is it's an open source platform for creating, editing, managing GTFS. What we like to say is it's our Swiss Army knife for everything GTFS. Anything you want to do with GTFS, you want to create it, you want to manipulate it, you want to deploy it, you want to just transform it, or you see all those uh, all caps in every station name and you need them to be more readable, well, we can do it. And for us, GTFS data tools or transit data tools is the tool uh, to, to do that work. Um, so what can it do? It can create a file from scratch. You can start by importing a CSV of stops, and then you can start building patterns and routes and timetables and calendars and create a full-fledged GTFS. Or you can get a GTFS from somewhere else. You can validate it. You can transform it. You can deploy it to something like OpenTripPlanner. 
and you can fix issues that you find with the feeds. You can um, edit existing files, uh, you can add a shuttle route, you can add a, you can remove trips, for example, if you have a major operator shortage that every transit agency in the country has. And now, as of a few months ago, actually, still in beta, uh, we are supporting the creation and editing of GTFS Flex as well. So, um, how can you get started? Well, we got a, a lot of inquiries from agencies to use our data tools uh, product. Um, it's open source, so anyone can set it up, but as those of you in the open source community know, it's not that easy to set up and maintain and deploy a system. So we have a multi-tenant instance, and as of two weeks ago, we have made it free for any small agencies. We just define them by, if you're an agency with 40 buses or less, we will give it away for free. This is our small contribution to the world of GTFS. We want data to exist. It is, again, the essential set for everything you all do in this room to, to work. And so we want to do something to have this, uh, to have GTFS be there for every agency in the world. If you're, a small, if you're not a small agency, talk to us. So uh, what does data tools look like? So I'm gonna actually show a live version. This is currently our deployment for Atlanta. Um, you're seeing every agency that we have data for. I'm just gonna pick MARTA, MARTA being the biggest transit agency in Atlanta. Um, you can do some simple things, check for uh, statistics, check for you know, number of trips, number of service hours per day. If there's any issue, you can find that out. You can go to a particular route and uh, figure out whether, you know, what is the service pattern on that particular route. You can check for validation issues. If there are things like, you know, there are warnings and there are errors and you can see, okay, in this case, there are multiple pa shapes that are associated with one pattern. We can fix that. Um, you can go into any of the issue and then go into the map-based editor, which I'll show in a second, and you can fix those. One of the powerful things we did, uh, we built was, many agencies have problems, but those problems happen every time they have a new file. So we created something called transformations, which is essentially programmatically applying changes to a GTFS feed, renaming every stop, making all caps to regular case, or uh, whenever you have AVE, you make it avenue or wherever, sometimes you have to add a fares file to every data set, but your fares file are maintained separately. Well, we can add it to the data set every time you load a new GTFS or you edit a new GTFS. We call this transformations. We think, we think it's really powerful for agencies to, again, to do those quick and dirty changes that they need to. Um, but the bulk of the system is really the editing capability. You can go into any feed. Um, you can start from scratch or you can use our tools to manipulate a feed. In this case, again, Atlanta's feed does not have a feed info file. If I start entering information, we validate on the fly. So as you start entering information, we will validate to see does it meet the specification. What we are going to add soon is does it meet best practices? Does it do the same thing that you are supposed to do per the best practices guide? Um, in routes, you can take a particular route and figure out, okay, what are the patterns on it? And again, I'm just showing you some information. Here is a pattern with the stops and the, tr and the, the sequence of, uh, of stops on, from origin to destination. You can look at times, you can edit times. If now you are, uh, your service is a little slower or a little faster, you can manipulate it. You can go in and make changes. For example, uh, you know, this service is right now on a detour. So I am just going to pull it so that it is running on a detour across three stops. Again, I'm just manipulating a file, but again, you can do this for a new file if you want to. All you need to do is start with stops, start building the pattern. We will automatically follow road uh, directions. So you will get nice, beautiful shapes. Very easy for small agencies to do. You can then build full calendars and uh, see how they look. So again, one example of there's a full calendar. You can go and manipulate one trip, add trips, remove trips, adjust the timings for a particular trip if you wanted to. And the result is a full GTFS file in all its glory. 
You can download it, you can upload it to S3 buckets and make it available to the world. Something we are working on now is Flex. So this is still, if something crashes, that's because this is still in test. Um, this is our, our test system currently creating GTFS Flex data. Uh, this is in Ireland. We are actually doing a project with uh, the entire country, well, two countries, to create uh, data, uh, flex data for them. So going into the editing functionality, going into a particular route, you can then see what the trip patterns are and what the zones are, and you can start putting information, again, per the flex data set to create these feeds. Now, as I said earlier, we made this free. One of the reasons is if you think about flex data sets, uh, the agencies that typically run flex service are the smaller rural community agencies. They have the least amount of technical capability to actually create flex data sets or have the tooling for that. We are just giving away the tooling. We want this to exist, so we're giving that away. So that, in a nutshell, is what we are doing. Um, we are going to be doing some more interesting things in the, in the uh, year to come. Uh, we are adding support for FAIRS v2. We are going to be adding support for pathways and keeping up with the evolution of the specs as they evolve. That's it. All right. Thank you very much, Ritesh. That was fantastic. So we're moving on to our next panelist, uh, Logan Nash, Director of Trans Technology at MBTA. Go ahead. Hi, everybody. I was really hoping that I was going to be doing sort of singer-songwriter mode like Ritesh here, but I'll do my best with the hand mic. So uh, I am Logan Nash. I'm from the MBTA, which is the transit agency for the Boston region. So we operate our buses, our subway trains, our commuter rail, our ferries. Um, but what I'm going to be talking about today is Skate, which is our in-house mobile bus dispatch app. Um, but to get into why we built Skate, I want to talk a little bit first about sort of what my group does here at the MBTA. So we are called the Customer Technology Department. Um, we are a 75-person cross-functional technology team. It is pretty unusual for a large public transit agency in the U.S. to have a staff that large of people like software engineers, designers, UX researchers, product managers in-house. We are very fortunate. We are also one of the largest transit agencies in the U.S., so we are, have these kinds of resources. Um, and what we do, uh, our mission is to apply these technology skills, apply best practices from the industry, to the problems that our riders in the Boston region have to make our system easy for all riders to use. Um, and specifically what we work on, you know, won't surprise the folks in this room, we work on, we publish our open data standards, we manage all of our uh, tracking technology that underlies our open data feeds and our APIs. Uh, we manage direct rider tools. We, we've built MBTA.com from the ground up as a tool to serve riders real-time information. We built an in-house alerts app so people know about what's going on with the service before they leave their home. Um, and in recent years, we've actually been doubling down in particular on physical infrastructure, digital infrastructure out there in our stations. So we've started deploying e-ink signs to many of our busiest light rail stops and bus stops. Um, we've also started deploying LCD screens to all of our subway stations um, and many of our newest um, high capacity bus stops as well, which is great, which is exciting. We love this stuff. But I, I think I... I think I speak for many people at this summit when I say that when it comes to open transit data, we need to go deeper. We need to do more. The data that we publish at the MBTA has been fundamentally really quite similar since you know, GTFS Real Time was first published in 2011. Um, but the information that our riders care about, the things that frustrate them the most, are things like cancellations, are things like detours. Ritesh, you were showing, we were drawing one in GTFS, uh, in the GTFS creator tool. That's great. Um, but that kind of data is really hard to create because when we are making those on-the-fly adjustments in service, when we are detouring a bus because a manhole exploded or something like that, those interventions, I mean, we did that just the other day, those interventions, those live in the heads of our officials, those people, those dispatchers, our uh, field supervisors, or even the bus operators themselves, they know what's happening in service. So the challenge for us, for the people in this room, is how do we get that information out of their hands out of their heads and into the hands of our transit riders. Which brings me to Skate. So one of the things that our department does is we manage our enterprise legacy bus dispatch system. I'm not going to name the vendor that we use to manage that system, but it is a legacy CAD AVL vendor. Lots of strengths, lots of weaknesses. Um, 
But a few years ago, back in 2018, 2019, we were looking at all the folks who it takes to run effective bus service at a big agency like ours. Um, so of course you have the bus drivers, the bus operators. Um, you know, they have not that much technology, right? But you know, we really need to be careful about what sort of bleepy bloopy things we're putting in front of our bus drivers, right? We gotta keep them focused on the road. They do have access to our dispatch systems sort of on vehicle interface. We've got our dispatchers in our control center. Obviously they are very important. Um, they're managing, they're sort of the centralized authority for what's going on in our service. Um, you know, they're doing all right with technology as well. We've got some um, sort of old school tools for them, but you know, they're behind a big desktop computer, they make it work. Um, but the people who are really hurting was our field inspectors, our folks out there at our stations in mobile cars, um, sort of the first responders when something goes wrong with service. Um, we weren't giving them very good technology to work with, which stinks. So uh, some of them had, you see these sort of old school, like honestly pretty crappy tablet computers that uh, we gave them and tried to maintain, um, you know, just kind of an insane trying to use a 1995 era dispatch interface on a little tablet computer like that. A lot of them were just relying on, you know, old fashioned pen, paper, print stuff out uh, kind of model, which, uh, you know, stinks for them, is a bad tool for them to have to manage service. That's unfair that we were giving them that level of technology. But also when we think about what is preventing us from publishing information about detours and adjustments and cancellations and things like that, you know, I know we've all been wrestling with the GTFS service changes spec. Yeah, that's hard, but these are the real blockers. The real blockers is the technology that we give our staff to tell us what they're doing with service. It's not very good. So 2019, we're thinking, all right, can we buy something off the shelf? Can we give our officials, especially our field officials, but also our dispatchers, better tools for managing service? Um, and the answer to that was, no, especially back then, especially three years ago. Um, I think, you know, for a few reasons. First of all, when we look at bus dispatch systems that are out there on the market today, most of those vendors are coasting on technology that was developed in the 90s and the 2000s. This is not technology that was built for people to use on tablets, on mobile phones, not built for people who are like out there in the thick of it, needing to ser manage service like on the street. Um, the other problem, and I know it'll be familiar to all of you in this room, is vendor lock-in. Not all vendors are like IBI. Not all vendors are like Swiftly, who I know is also in the audience. Not all vendors, by default, give us access to our own data. There was no way that we were going to buy another piece of technology that was just going to paywall us to access our information. Uh, no more micro-monopolies in this industry, please. Uh, and then the final thing is that a lot of the tools just weren't very good. Um, when you think about designing tools for transit operations staff, you have to remember that most of these people came up in their careers driving a bus, driving a train. Most of them, when they started doing what they're doing now, had never used a computer to do their job before. That's a really hard paradigm shift to make for people like us, for computers and technologies is all we think about. But that is exactly who we need to build for if we are building tools for transit operations staff. So we decided to build a tool called Skate an in-house bus dispatch app for our field officials. And our goal in building that tool was to enable them to share information across bus operations staff, across, you know, across each other, and out there to riders. And what was great about this is we were able to leverage some of the same skills, some of the same approaches, some of the same people that we use to build tools for riders. We were able to apply those same skills to building tools for our operations staff. Um, so first off, that involved building in a mobile-first approach. We decided to issue Android tablets to all of our field staff. Uh, no more bespoke hardware. Uh, we were able to do user research. We still do continuously user research with all of our officials, always getting feedback from them, learning about what their needs are. Um, and, uh, we, and I think importantly for this crowd, we built on top of our existing APIs. We'd done so much work to uh, modernize all of our APIs to get our data in GTFS and GTFS real time to build tools for riders. We built on top of those same APIs to build tools for operations staff. So that includes our open data APIs, also APIs from partners like Swiftly, like Samsara, like IBI, vendors that are giving us those APIs we need to do our work. Um, so this is what it looks like. Skate, um, this sort of root ladder paradigm here. I'll, we can poke around with Skate in a little bit. We pulled it up on Ritesh's laptop. Um, you know, this is the kind of visualization of transit data that makes zero sense to people who like 
aren't living and breathing bus operations, right? Like we would never show this to riders. Um, but our operations staff, they love this view, right? This route ladder view. So every triangle on there is a, a bus. It's early or later on time. Every little ghost icon on there is a bus that should be in service but is not. Um, not an uncommon occurrence these days, unfortunately. Uh, and every rung on that route ladder is a major stop. Um, I think a great thing about sort of taking this in-house approach is that we were able to kind of build exactly to the needs of our operations staff. So one challenge for us is that our legacy dispatch system does not handle rail replacement shuttles. So when we need to do work on our rail system, run replacement buses, um, for the most part, our staff historically have been kind of flying blind. So we were able to build a special tool in Skate to make use of the data we have to show them sort of what's happening, show our staff what's happening um, during a shuttling operation and help them manage service for our riders. Um, and then finally, and this is really getting sort of into the weeds a little bit, but we um, built some specific features to help our officials out in the field manage what we call swing-ons and swing-offs. So that's when an official, uh, maybe one driver is ending their shift, they drop a bus off at a station, another driver is supposed to pick up that bus and do another piece of work. That's the kind of thing that can go wrong pretty easily, a hard situation for our staff to manage. So we built some tools so they could retire the kind of like paper home, homegrown stuff that, that they were doing themselves, which don't get me wrong, was awesome. But we're glad that we're able to give them some digital tools to help them with these kinds of situations. Um, so don't take my word for it. I mean, the great thing about doing this work within a transit agency is that we're always talking to our users, whether those users are riders, whether those users are operation staff. So, you know, these are just some quotes from some of the um, bus inspectors who use Skate and who we rolled it out to and who we're talking to all the time. Um, but I think the coming back to what we were talking about at the beginning about what's next for rider information for transit, I think what's really exciting about Skate is this is our platform to give better data to bus riders. Um, that when an official is making an intervention in service, whether that's canceling a bus, holding a bus, making a detour, we want them to make that intervention in Skate or another great open so source tool like IBI's Alerts Interface, make that intervention, and then we can incorporate it into the transit data that our riders see when they're using Transit App or MBTA.com or Google Maps. I love that crossed out bus. I don't, well, I kind of hate that that crossed out bus is there, but I love that we were able to cross it out, right? Um, that's what we want to do to make our rider information better, and that's um, how Skate is going to help us do it. Um, zooming out even more, for us, Skate is kind of an opening salvo against this entire industry, uh, I'll call it a toxic relationship with, but with our dispatch technology, that for so long, us transit agencies have been locked into these black box vendor systems, where because we made a certain investment 20 years ago with a certain system, Every bus we buy from now on has to have some $10,000 piece of equipment that does a lot of jobs and a lot of them not particularly well. Um, we want to break out of that paradigm. If we have all of our dispatchers, all of our officials using Skate to manage service, then suddenly it doesn't matter so much what other technology is on the bus. We can build a modular platform for managing our service. We can buy the best tools for the job, the best automated announcement system, the best interface for operators to uh, see what's going on in, in the in the operator's compartment. Um, we don't need to be reliant on one vendor and worrying about change orders for integration or things like that. This is going to be huge for interoperability, which I know is a big topic this, this week. Um, so what's next for us? Uh, we are very excited about the possibility. Right now, Skate is still a read-only tool, but this year we are going to be opening the Pandora's box of uh, using Skate to generate this service changes data, generate information about the interventions that we m are making in service, um, we're also um, going hard on this idea of a modular dispatch technology platform. So we're expanding Skate from a tool just for field officials. We're expanding it to a tool for our back office dispatchers too. Um, we're also building a version of Skate for light rail. It's called Glides. Glides is skating on, we on rails. Wait, or maybe, or maybe skating is gliding on wheels. Anyway, a lot of puns to go around. We're excited about that. And then I think lastly, like I said, this is... Um, this, for us, this is a good way to get our hands dirty with some of the topics from this week, such as the data interoperability, the mobility data interoperability principles, such as the operational data standards that we're working on with Cal ITP and other folks. Um, this is a use case for how are we communicating internal operations data across systems and then rethinking that data for use by riders uh, via consumer apps, which is very exciting. Um, 
So that's it. I've got my contact information up here. Skate is open source. I should have mentioned that. So if you want to check out the Git, the GitHub, please check it out. Uh, we're also always hiring software engineers, designers, product managers. So if you'd love to come work for a transit agency, um, you know, come talk to me. Thanks very much. Do you want to show? It? Oh yeah, we got some time. Why don't I? Why don't I show you Skate? I. Uh, was sort of joking with potentials. Let's, let's just log in on your laptop. All right, this is great. So we got a notification up here. The OCC has reported that an operator has been diverted from the 111. The 111 is one of our most important high frequency bus routes. So we can take a look at that. It looks like our dispatcher left a note on the 111 here. Let's pull up the 111 route ladder. Let's see what that looks like. So uh, you can, we can see all the different buses we have operating on this route. Some of them are on time. Some of them are very late, like this one, 20 minutes late. Um, one of the things that we were able to incorporate into Skate during the pandemic was uh, our real-time occupancy information. This was a big effort for us in response to COVID-19. We uh, really tore our hair out trying to publish um, crowding information, information about service crowding out to riders in the early months of the pandemic. Um, that took a lot of work. We were able to get that out to riders in July of 2020. And the nice thing was because Skate is an in-house tool, we were able to build that into our um, into skate as well. And so if I click on, let's say, our Route 66, another one of our key bus routes, um, you can actually see sort of uh, this like crowding icon here. So you can see which buses are crowded, which buses are not crowded. Like I said, this little icon, this ghost icon here means that's a ghost bus, a bus that should be in service is not. But we can see that a dispatcher has sort of explained this, right? So this has a dispatcher note on it. If we were to open the transit app right now and take a look at Route 66 in Boston, we would see that strike through telling riders, hey, don't wait on this bus, it's not coming, which like I said, is not exactly uh, the news we always want to be telling people, but at least we can be upfront and honest with folks um, when it comes to rider information. So, um, you know, I, uh, if po people want to poke around, skate more, come talk to me afterwards. And, uh, but yeah, thanks for having me here to talk with you all. Thank you. Hello. Um, hello, my name is Antoine Augusti. Uh, I'm a senior software engineer at uh, the French National Access Point to Transport Data uh, in France. Um, so previously I worked here in Montreal at the Canadian Digital Service in the Federal Government of Canada. And previously I was working at uh, the French Prime Minister Services. Uh, so I was working on data policy, data driven products, and I worked a lot on uh, search and rescue at sea uh, previously. Uh, and I also teach a bit uh, in university engineering schools uh, about public policy, uh, software engineering, uh, legislation, and stuff like that. And I'm going to talk to you about uh, the, the platform we have at uh, transport.data.gov.fr today. Um, so what do we have? So we've got a website, uh, and basically we want to um, publish every uh, thing we've got about transport in France. So what I mean by that is that uh, we've got uh, data about public transit, we've got data about carpooling, long distance coaches, trains, uh, road data, um, low emission zones, stuff like that. Um, our platform uh, should have it all, uh, and we want to make sure that uh, it is used um, by a lot of people. So road planners, other government, other agencies, private companies, anyone uh, wants to use it. Um, our mission is really uh, to encourage the use of sustainable mobility solutions. So we want to promote uh, uh, sustainable mobility solutions such as uh, public transit, bikes, etc. And to do that, we need to have data and we need to uh, be able to give the data to people so that they can move around using the appropriate solution. Um, we also want to raise awareness and encourage data producers to open their data. So we want to show what's available, what's not available yet, what's uh, of good quality and what's not. Uh, we want to make life easier for data users. So we want to make sure that uh, if uh, Google Maps or Apple or uh, whoever wants to use uh, our data, it's easy to find, it's accurate, it's available. If they've got issues, they can get in touch with us. We'll work with them to make sure that they've got what they need. And uh, so this is the next bullet point. So we want to be an intermediary between producers and reusers of the data. Uh, so in France, we've got uh, more than 300 agencies in France. So we don't want a 
for them to, to it's hard f even for us to know everyone. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's best if they come talk to us. Uh, we are able to get in touch with everyone. We know people, we know operators, we know uh, how they work, um, and uh, that's easier for them. Um, we, also, um, we also are coming from the another um, thing larger than France uh, is the European Directive, um, which has got a lot of uh, very interesting stuff about uh, mobility uh, in Europe, about uh, open data, um, interoperability, uh, sustainable mobility, um, in information about uh, carbon emission and stuff like that. So um, we've got a wide range of uh, features. I'm going to demo you uh, first um, because it's going to be funnier to do it live. So uh, as I was saying, we've got a, a website uh, showing uh, various uh, categories of data. Um, so as I was saying, we've got uh, more than 300 uh, uh, data sets uh, just for uh, public uh, transport. Uh, but we also have got uh, data about rail, road data, low emission zone, carpooling, uh, charging uh, vehicles, um, refueling station, uh, parking, uh, stuff like that. Um, so I'm going to show you maybe um, what it looks like for um, a public uh, transit uh, system. So I picked my city. I live in Dijon, which is like a, a small, not really small, but uh, still not Paris <laughs> in France. Uh, so if we go to their uh, page, uh, we see that they've got a GTFS. Thankfully, it's up to date. It has been uh, available all the time uh, in the previous days, so we know that it's not uh, broken. They don't have a server that uh, don't work at night. Uh, at the moment, they don't have uh, like uh, warnings. They don't have uh, like errors on their feed. They've got a few warnings. We can take a look at those. We know that they've got information about buses and trains and tramways. And they've got also real-time resources. So they've got two GTFS RT feeds, uh, one with vehicle position and another one with trip updates. Uh, we can take a look at those afterwards. We know who is using it. So my bus and transit use it. At least they, they told it about it. We've got a, a bit of discussion. So uh, sometimes people say, like, uh, uh, this stuff is not up to date. Uh, you, can you fix it? Uh, like, uh, uh, I noticed something wrong, so we got a wide range of discussion about that. And we also provide um, previous version of the GTFS, so we are in charge of monitoring that and making sure that uh, it's updated. So if you want to look back at what was the public offer like uh, uh, three weeks uh, ago, like uh, we have it. I'm um, just going to show you what it looks like uh, for validation. So um, we, uh, we say what's inside. We provide a visualization of the shapes, the stops, and stuff like that, just to get an idea of what's inside the data uh, so that you don't have to, to do it yourself. And then we've got validation reports uh, saying that, uh, so they don't have a word, but they've got warnings, like IDs are not all in ASCII, so it could, it could cause some issues for some systems. So we say uh, that uh, maybe they need to fix on it. And they've got also some information. So maybe it's OK, maybe it's not. So they've got closed stops. Like, um, I'm not sure this is OK, uh, this one. Like, uh, um, maybe they need to take a look at it and fix it on their side. They've got also like, uh, an excessive speed between two stops. So you see like, uh, um, it's riding, like, I guess, too fast. Uh, so like more than 2,000 uh, kilometers. Per. So obviously, that's not good. So maybe they, they need to fix uh, uh, this uh, on their side. Um, and yeah, we've got uh, everything uh, for every public agency in France. I'm going to show you also like, uh, uh, sorry, up the real time resources. So we've got a feed for vehicle position and uh, they've got a warning. So uh, like uh, the vehicle speed is not good as well. One more time, I would say. <laughs> so I think that, uh, yeah, they, they didn't put the right units, but uh, um, so um, we will get in touch with them. Actually, we already did, but uh, they, are in the, uh, they are going to fix it. Um, in the coming days. At the moment, it's a night uh, in France, so they don't have like, uh, they don't run, uh, but uh, uh, we've got that. And also we, we see that uh, it's mostly reliable over time because like, uh, they had a small downtime. Um, and what's good also is that we, we provide the ability for anyone to actually validate uh, the JTFS RT now. So uh, our website can do it and you, you get a report saying that it was valid or not. So it says that it is valid, but I guess it's because the feed is empty because again, it's uh, a night in France at the moment. Um, 
So it was public transit, but I'm going to show you like maybe uh, another thing quickly. So uh, we've got also uh, data about uh, bikes or scooters, electric scooters. Um, so if you operate like uh, if you're a private company operating in France, you have to open up uh, your GBFS feed. Uh, so we've got information about it. We show like a small uh, map of it just to again give an idea what's inside the feed uh, so that you, you you know to use it. And we we run like a um, validation. We we've got also uh, metadata about it, so you know what's available uh, quickly again. So uh, uh, it's all on our website, and we also have a, an API where, again uh, just to have uh, this this data. Uh, up, let me go back to this. So I show you that. So we also like display service alerts, uh, stuff like that. Validation on demand. So it's really important, like. Uh, um, if you're a public agency or if you're processing data, you're able like, to use our website for free uh, without, uh, without authentication. You just uh, drag and drop your data. You say like this is a GTFS, this is a GTFS RT, this is a low emission zone, and we are, uh, we are going to be able to tell you, yes, it is valid, it makes sense, we got vis visualization. You got a link that you can share with your colleagues or um, your uh, agency to, to say that, uh, yeah, it works or not, or you need to, to fix stuff. Um, so why we are choosing open source uh, on our team? Um, first principle, like very important for us, uh, it's public money, so it's, it should be public code. Uh, like uh, um, we uh, are paid by uh, citizens' money, uh, taxes, so um, we need to make sure that uh, what the work we are doing is actually benefiting uh, our country, uh, our companies, and the ecosystem. Um, we also work in the open. This means that uh, our roadmap or issues or pull requests are, are available for anyone to see, and you can question that uh, if you want to. Uh, again, that's very important uh, as a government. Uh, it's, we are also a very small team. Uh, we don't have like a big budget, um, and we are trying to to have like a, the most impact that we can. So it makes sense to use actually uh, open source because like uh, you can pick something that people really work on it and uh, use it for your needs and uh, make sure that it's used to to do the the most impact uh, on, on the field. Uh, we also want to be an active player in the ecosystem. Like uh, we are getting a lot from open source tools, so we want to be present. We want to show up. We want to um, participate in discussion. We want to fix issues. We want to report issues. So that's, that's very important. We also want to use industry recognized tools because uh, we know that uh, public agencies need to integrate with Google Maps, with CityMapper, uh, with other um, European countries and, and companies. So we want to make sure that we've got the same tooling and that what we, they do, so that uh, if we get uh, an error, uh, they will have it, so they need to fix it, and we, we've got the same information. And, and also, it's important uh, for us to be accountable. So you see, like we are going to display a validation report for every city, every uh, everything in France. Uh, so it's very important to be able to explain uh, uh, what happened, which tool we use, uh, and how we came up with a, a, a report saying that uh, your feed was wrong. Because uh, of course, it's not uh, good uh, to have the national government saying like, oh, something is wrong on your on your side. It is, they want to. We want to be able to explain that, of course. And what do we do with open source? Uh, first, our platform that I showed you, like uh, it's uh, open source, so it's, it's written in Elixir, which is like a, a language similar to Ruby. Um, yeah. It's very good for real-time uh, data for GBFS and uh, GTFS RT, proxy, caches, like uh, caches, it's uh, really good. And when you're operating uh, as a country, like it's very, really important to have a uh, good uh, uh, tooling. Um, we've got like close to 100 stars on GitHub, so it's not too bad. Um, we've got also our own GTFS validator, uh, Boo, again, uh, and it's uh, written in Rust, uh, just to be fast and to iterate quickly again. Uh, we use a lot of things for mobility data, so of course uh, GBFS, GBFS validator, GTFS RT, GTFS documentation, specification. Um, and uh, for other type of data, so as I was saying, like a low emission zone, cycling, uh, carpooling, stuff like that, um, we, um, when standards don't, do not exist uh, internationally or at the European level. We work with the ecosystem to create uh, a standards w standard standardized way uh, to uh, create it. And so we've got a um, national schema platform where we explain specification um, and in the JSON schema, table schema, XSD, XML, whatever, um, but at least it's standardized. And we also have got um, a few uh, collaborative uh, data creation tooling uh, so that you can actually uh, edit uh, geographical data, carpooling places, um, 
in a structured manner and you can collaborate with your, your people to create like a good uh, data sets and, uh, and schemas. Um, and yeah, that's it. And yeah, that's it. That is for me. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that was great. So we're gonna open up the Q&A session. Uh, any questions you might have, just please raise your hands. I'll pass you, I'll pass you the mic, and then you ask the panelists. Oh, there's a mic there. So who wants to start with questions? I'll have one over there. So hello, I'm Christophe Duquesne. I'm from France. I'm working at the CEN level, so the standardization at European level. Uh, I've been involved in uh, open source for quite a while, uh, being the originator of a source uh, that was presented this, this, this morning, of, uh, so the, Sh the Chouette, which is now managed by, by uh, en route, and which is used in Norway and several, several countries. There's one thing which is very difficult in open source, is the community. Um, uh, so here I see that, that you do have community of users, but there's another community, which is a community of developers. And it's, I also often see it very difficult to manage to have a good community of developers. And, and the project you have presented are mainly still one single company or one single team uh, project, not really having a, a huge community of, 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 of developers. And, and we were facing exactly the same same thing with, with, with Schwetz. Uh, I know it's a difficult uh, topic, but how do you see the way to build a, a, a community of, of developer? Would it mean to try to uh, have these multiple uh, tools good to go together? I mean, typically, I see Schwetz being very close to uh, the, 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 the tool from I I IBE. Uh, but one is more focusing on, on the GTFS side, the other is more focusing on, on the, the NetX and, 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 and the European standards. Uh, maybe there's a way to build a kind of community to have uh, things all together. But so, so my question is mainly, how, how do you see a way to build the community of developers for mobility tools? I can. Um, great question. Um, it's difficult because what you're seeing here is three different products that fulfill a specific need. That said, again, there are benefits of open source without having a huge developer and diverse developer community behind it. Doesn't mean that other, other companies, entities, governments don't start with that and, and run with it and still use them. It might be one, it might be 10, it might be hundreds. Now that said, the question is about building a community. And um, so one of the other software systems that IBI works on is Open Trip Planner. And Open Trip Planner is a very successful transit open source product. The good thing is it solves a problem for many, many agencies. It's not a single use system. It was never built as that. It was built as a public facing trip planner. Because of that, there is a community of hundreds of developers with at least a dozen plus companies and governments across the world. What's important there is like building consensus and building community and building a group that actually collaborates on features and on the evolution of the system. It requires a lot of co communication. It requires a lot of coordination, maybe way more than maybe is required, but it still, it requires a lot of it. Um, but not every open source system, product, will have a developer community. That doesn't mean you shouldn't do open source. Yeah, I definitely agree with that, Ritesh. I think actually you did a great summary of like all these benefits of, of, of writing an open source code, only one of which I think would be developing a community of you know, that's also contributing that back to the code base. It's nice when that happens. We're, you know, we use open trip planners as well, but I think there's a lot of other reasons that we chose to write Skate, and in fact, all of the software that we write at the MBTA is open source code. Um, although actually, I think you know, one of the barriers to developing a community is, actually some, it's funny, something Ritesh, you and I talked about before is like the code, the language you use. So you know, Skate is written in Elixir. I think it was the last time I saw you at a conference, you were like, Logan, why'd you write Skate in Elixir? No one's gonna like, use that, it's such a wacky language. So it, it warms my heart to see that. <laughs> Uh, There's Elixir. one more person who yes. uses Elixir. Yes, we're building an Elixir community right here <laughs> in the transit data industry. You heard it here first. Um, but I'd be curious, are there, you know, you meant there's a lot of stuff, seems like a lot of things going on under the hood 
um, with your system that like the validation and so on where you might have drawn from some open source tools. So you maybe even if there's not other contributors in your community, maybe there's your you're sort of a user for other folks' uh, libraries and so on. Is that is that true? Sorry. Uh, yes. So uh, yeah, to answer your question, like uh, as you said, like uh, language is very important. Like of course, if you got a team of uh, software engineers and they are used to working in a language, like uh, if a tool is available in another language, like it's uh, hard to be able like to fit in your ecosystem. Uh, like f just to answer your question, like uh, uh, we we use some other tools like in Java and uh, other languages, but it's not as easy as uh, Elixir because uh, this is what we are used to. Um, but when it's required and when it makes sense, we do the extra work to, uh, to isolate it, run it in a Docker container, run it uh, elsewhere, to interact with it, with the APIs, with a uh, JSON file, with databases, like uh, we, do, we do the work. We are not going to rewrite everything from scratch, uh, of course. Um, but yeah, I agree, like it makes sense. Um, and to go back to the question, like uh, I agree, it's hard. Um, but uh, I'm also glad that we are here. We, we've got like a mobility data uh, trying to uh, gather um, a community uh, around documentation, specification, tooling, uh, discussion. Um, and so I mean like uh, it's going in the right di direction, uh, I think. Um, and as long as we are okay to, to meet, to talk, to work together, to work in the open, um, to not have like a uh, authentication, documents that are not accessible, stuff like that. Like, uh, I think it's really important to to, to continue the, in this direction. Hi, <coughs> Anthony from Google Maps. Um, I actually want to build on that on that question. I think that was a really great one. And I'm wondering if, um, I guess this would be probably a question mostly for Logan, um, and, and maybe a, a bit for you, Ritesh. But I'm wondering if you can talk a bit about if um, if the if the purpose of open sourcing is not to create a developer community. Um, could you just enumerate the, the sort of values for, for your organizations in open sourcing the code that you did? And um, did you, are you actively doing any, any work to sort of make it more reusable as, an, a, a, as an, uh, an open source package? Or is it the sort of thing that you put out there in the world once and kind of don't really have expectations for it to ever be be used really so, so I think you know we, there was a pretty good articulation of like you know the various reasons that as an organization we might choose to develop open source code I, I you know I would almost boil that down to that it's like you know we're a public agency it's public money this is table stakes um, to release our code out there in the open and because we are using so many other open source libraries and by sort of contributing back to the open source community just on a practical level it allows us to use libraries that otherwise we might have to, you know, maybe their licenses are more restrictive, for example. Um, but I think that, but you're right that we, we don't do a whole lot to promote an open source community around our products because that's all, it's not our main goal in making them open source. And I think even more philosophically, it's like, you know, my salary, the, the salary of the other folks here from the MBTA all comes from transit riders and taxpayers in Massachusetts. And, you know, the amount of time that we can sort of ethically spend supporting another, even another, you know, or fellow transit agencies to adopt Skate or to adopt NBTA.com or another one of our open source tools, yeah, we'd love to help them out, but we can't spend that much time on it, really. Our duty is to, to the riders of the MBTA. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's sort of disappointing to me. I think that, like, I, I wish we could spend more time helping other agencies, but I think there's also a lot of great sort of for-profit companies out there. IBI is one of them who will really um, sort of take on some of this, some of these open source applications, you know, if not as sort of a community building effort, just as a way to say, hey, we think there might be some profit in, you know, adapting and selling and supporting um, these tools. Open Trip Planner is a great example. I think Transit Clock would be would be another one in the community. Uh, maybe Ritesh, you want to talk more about that? Yeah, so answering it from the almost opposite perspective, we are not a public agency. It's not public money. Um, we think a couple of things. You can make money from open source software. You just don't sell the software. You're selling services around it. Um, there is an inherent good 
in making the software available. So I'll give a few examples. Uh, a couple of months ago, we got contacted by a transit authority in Sri Lanka who wants to set up a who wants to set up a way to create GTFS in cities around Sri Lanka. If any of you have been reading the news in Sri Lanka, um, it's a huge economic crisis. There is no way that we can charge anything that makes sense to do the work, but it's an open source tool they can set it up on their own. They can start using it and have it create great data. So there is a benefit there. Another benefit is, so for example, we are an American Canadian company. Our entire focus is in English, um, but most of the world is not English speaking. So how do we do translations? We cannot do that ourselves. We depend on the community to do that. So we have some partners in Poland who also want to use the same platform and are working with, the, with us on translations and making it to, so internationalization. They are helping us add features, essentially making it compatible in other languages. A benefit we wouldn't have, or, or something we would have never done, but it's also, it's kind of a, a, a sharing. They give something which is the translation. What we get is a now a translated product that can be used in a different place. So um, there are, again, inherent benefits to it. Uh, that said, you know, it, it is difficult. Um, and the more important thing is, as a for-profit company for us, uh, we decide, uh, we've made a decision to not lock in our clients. If we are not the best company or product to work with, they might pay us, but they won't be happy and we definitely won't get the next contract. So might as well do this in the open, might as well do a great job doing it. Uh, hi. Um, uh, my question is for Logan, uh, again, maybe. <laughs> uh, um, it's the reason uh, I would like to know, uh, my question is, the structure of your organization. Okay, you mentioned you are seven, 75 people on your department. So I would like to know if, uh, if you manage all of them, the people, or you uh, different people work on other direction, or uh, just I would like to explain. Could you explain uh, how uh, your organization? Uh, re regarding the, the the structure of the organization? Yeah, it's actually, it's a really great question because it is a little, frankly, it's kind of hard to run a uh, technology sort of software organization within a public sector agency. I think we can all really relate to that. Um, so, and our model is, is interesting. So my department is called the Customer Technology Department. And as that suggests, we're focused on you know, tools and data for MBTA's customers, our riders. So there's also a traditional IT department of the MBTA. Um, we, like that IT department, we report to the chief information officer who reports up to the chief administrative officer who reports to our general manager. Um, that's actually probably the least interesting part of it. The more interesting part is sort of internally how we manage ourselves. So we're a matrixed organization. We have, um, you know, a lot of our staff, for example, are software engineers. None of the software engineers report to me, even though they're often working on um, sort of t applications and products that are within my sort of area. So we have a director of engineering. All our software engineers report to them. We have a director of um, uh, design. All of our designers report to her. Actually, our director of product, Ruth Miller, is here today. All of our product managers report to her. Um, and then we also have, I'm a different kind of manager in the department. I'm what we call a program manager. So I manage our transit tech program area, which is all of our open data, our dispatch systems, our underlying tracking hardware. We have a program manager for rider tools, like the website. And then we have uh, another program manager for digital signage. And then finally, we have actually a brand new program manager for sort of internal technology projects. So we've kind of separated the sort of I don't need to be a good manager of software engineers. In fact, you wouldn't want to let me near your code at all, right? We have someone who's good at that, but he doesn't have to be an expert in, say, you know, transit scheduling or, you know, talking to people in bus operations about their needs, right? Like we're um, so it's I think it's a kind of a common model in the 
technology industry, but it's pretty unusual in public sector organizations, at least in the U.S. And um, it's, you know, frankly, kind of hard to maintain that that matrix model because it's a fair amount of fair amount of overhead. But it, we found it to be pretty effective. I can take I can take a question. I can ask you a question. So. Uh, it's it's first to Logan, then to the other, then to the other two panelists. So you mentioned that you that COVID kind of made you change a few things in Skate, and you had to add occupancy. So can you elaborate on on how COVID affected Skate, and then if Antoine or Ritesh want to add something about COVID, please do so. Yeah, so I showed some of that occupancy data in Skate. I think you know, big picture, it was interesting working on in-house software to transit agency at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, I think I remember actually sending a note to someone in December of 2019 who was talking about sort of real-time occupancy data, and I was like, ah, we're never going to be able to like make that work. It's years away, whatever. Um, and then April 2020 came around, and we're like, oh, holy crap! This is the only thing that we should be working on right now, as it turns out. So, um, you know, I, well, we were able to pull a little bit of a rabbit out of our hats, and that we we've been we've gotten so good at pulling data out of our legacy dispatch system that even though that system was never, it connects to our passenger counters, that system was never designed to share real-time information about occupancy. But our software engineers were able to sort of basically strip mine the data out of the system. Our designers sort of thought about a way to present information about occupancy and crowding in the context of a pandemic. And in about three months, we were able to get that shipped out so that riders using transit app and mbta.com uh, in July of 2020 were able to see real-time crowding conditions on their bus. Um, we were the largest public transit agency in the U.S. to make this information available on local buses, and I think that's that's one of the things I'll always be the proudest of um, in my time working at the MBTA. But that was only possible because we had that in-house expertise to do that work, to rip that data out of our legacy systems, to put that data into our rider-facing systems, to add that data to Skate, which was also an in-house tool. You know, if we'd been waiting on some of our less savvy vendors to do that, we would probably still be waiting for those change orders today. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's something that we can do as a larger agency is sometimes we can just push ahead when it comes to some of these emerging data standards. Um, I, I will say, I think as an industry, the way we think about occupancy data now, the number of agencies who are publishing occupancy data now looks very different than it did in you know, February of 2019. We think about this data very differently than we did in February 2019. Um, uh this is slightly different, on, but again, affected by COVID. Uh, we found that having an easy-to-use tool to manipulate GTFS really helped during the first months of COVID. There was, everything was changing so rapidly. Um, the dirty little secret of GTFS is almost every agency that produces it produces it from a scheduling system. And it is incredibly difficult to generate a new GTFS. It's a multi-step, multi-week, sometimes multi-month process to actually get there. So we realized we had a tool that you could you know cut trips add trips shuttle trips change schedules change timetables very easily so one of our first forays into making the system that you saw free was actually during covid what we said is in the first six to 12 months of covid i think this was somewhere around may 2020 we said if you are an agency that wants to manipulate your gtfs in a web-based system just talk to us We'll just give you access for free. And we, we, we actually got a lot of uptake because um, agencies wanted to communicate changes to their riders, wanted to have up-to-date GTFS, but their scheduling systems couldn't do it. We had a tool that allowed them to do it. All right, thank you very much. Antoine, do you want to add anything? Oh, no, no, Because okay, I have one last question and then I think we can call this. Uh, my question is to Antoine specifically. So you showed that you can display um, the status of the feeds up on the website. And I wonder if a feed is down, what is your responsibility as the access point? You know, do, do, you, know, do you know what happened or is it your responsibility to, do, to take some action or you just observe? Um, so no, we, we do have a responsibility. So we are not the publisher. We are not the producer most of the time. Um, but we are still the national access point, so we care about it. We we have the appropriate tooling to detect it, to get in touch with the people, and to act uh, as the national government saying, like, uh, your system is down, or your system is slow, or your system is not up to date, so you need to do something about it. Um, so, yeah, we do circle back with people, either publicly or in private, like uh, by phone or by email. 
Um, and also, we've, we've got a regulator in France. Uh, we never like to uh, do audit, uh, ask for reports, or provide uh, penalties or fines um, to local or private companies if they do not publish the data or if the data is really uh, not uh, up to date or not uh, great uh, for a long time and they do not show a willingness to improve. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's also on us to report about the state uh, of the data, what's available, what's not. When something is done, uh, what's appropriate, uh, what's an appropriate amount of time to fix it, um, and to yeah to to get uh, figures uh, for friends and for various uh, data sets. All right, thank you. Uh, one last time to ask the attendees: any questions to our panelists? Going once, twice. All right. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. A big thank you to our panelists, first of all. Thank you for the presentation and thank you for attending.